Hello, everybody. How's it going? I'm Christian Pettit. I'm with Flatwedge Separation Technology. We specialize in centrifuges and separation solutions for uh, for all processes in all industries, but I specialize in the brewery and beverage industry. So I'm here to talk to you today about using Flatwedge decanter centrifuges for hot side separation to recover hot wort from trube and uh, other uh, materials that are uh, lost with the uh, whirlpool process. So um, this is something that we've worked on for a long time. I think we started with this process around uh, 2005 or 2006 using uh, decanters for wort recovery. We found that there was some need in uh, some breweries for this process. They have a lot of losses with their, their tube pile going down, or with wort going down the drain. Um, we first pilot tested this process by collecting collecting the tube and the wort that go down the drain from the, uh, from the whirlpool into a a large buffer tank. Uh, it was at a, at a really large brewery that had losses of upwards of 60 barrels per brew. Um, so we used a tank, we collected all that stuff, uh, found that we could separate it, get really dry solids and really clean liquid out of the process that can go right back into the uh, into the uh, fermenters. And uh, there was quite a bit of yield to be re recovered there. So um, that was our first major project was a big brewery that had a thousand barrel brew house and so we were actually able to recover 60 barrels per per batch per brew, um, and from there we started uh, snowballing that into some other breweries and uh, working it into uh, some craft breweries and stuff. And we found that this is a, a good way to increase your yields if you have headway losses, especially from uh, high gravity beers. Uh, one uh, brewery that does a lot of big barrel aged stouts uh, uses one of these, and they've noticed some really nice gains in, uh, in yield. So you can see by the first slide here. This basically shows the, uh, the places in a brewery where you can have centrifuges or separation technologies uh, where we've actually installed them in different breweries. One we're focusing on here is the decanter for the hot wort recovery, but of course there are plenty of others, a belt press for spent, spent grain pressing uh, coming off the louder ton. Some breweries like to, uh, to dry that stuff out and use it as a bunker fuel or burn it, uh, boilers, things like that. The SETI canter is a machine that we use in a lot of large breweries for beer recovery from spent yeast, so all the, the discharge from your vertical centrifuges can be collected and the, the spent uh, yeast can be dewatered, the beer can be recovered, fed back into the front end of the brewery. That's typically a process for a large commercial brewery that makes mostly light uh, Pilsner lager type beers and they can, they can blend that stuff back in without it being detectable at a very small, slow rate. Obviously that wouldn't work for a craft brewery because they're making so many types of uh, IPAs, hazy beers, stouts, porters, pilsners, and can't mix those, obviously. So, um, green beer clarification that's another thing that's typically in very large breweries or in some of the European breweries as well. Uh, we do that stuff. Uh, and then after that, you see the turbidity adjustment for uh, cloudy beer. A lot of the Germans do the Hefeweizens and things. So, we work uh, with some of those breweries doing that kind of stuff. And it's a situation where you're separating the beer, clarifying it. And, uh, but also bypassing the machine with a certain amount of uh, unfiltered beer to maintain that turbidity. Uh, we also do the clarification before filtration or clarification in place of filtration uh, for the finished product, which is pretty pretty common here in the U.S. Most uh, good sized breweries have some sort of centrifuge. And of course, the, the decanter at the bottom for what the Germans call Kisselrohr, which is actually the diatomaceous earth uh, from the filter to filter. Uh, we use those for dewatering that stuff in some large scale commercial breweries too. So. But uh, alas, we'll stick with the Flatwig decanter for hot wort recovery on this talk. So the there we go. next slide. What we want to talk about here is the feed solids concentration by volume in terms of a percentage. Um, there are a lot of methods of liquid solid separation. Um, has to be properly selected, the, the type of machine you use has to be properly selected uh, for the type of feed that you have. You can see this uh, chart here kind of shows the range that each type of machine or each type of system would have in terms of particle size versus solids concentration in the feed. 
Um, the disc stack centrifuge, which is the traditional way of clarifying beer uh, in a brewery, those obviously um, designed for small amounts of solids, not really high, uh, high feed solids, and also not really large particles. So uh, yeast, proteins, things like that, that's what these machines are designed to separate. They, uh, they do it really well. They have high G-force, but they also have to be optimized for it. There's a lot of factors that come into play with a uh, disc stack centrifuge, the correct bowl angle, the correct uh, disc stack size and spacing, um, and then all the other things like the distributor and the centripetal pump inside. Uh, they absolutely have to be optimized for the process. The next one would be a SETI canter, which I mentioned earlier. We do a lot of dewatering of spent yeast and uh, fermentation broths and things. It's a popular machine in uh, pharmaceutical and chemical processing as well as beverage uh, production. That machine is a bit of a hybrid between a decanter and a disc stack centrifuge, whereas it, it'll it process uh, small fine particles at high G-force, but it can also handle high concentrations of feed solids, which um, makes that machine very unique. Like I said, it's kind of a hybrid between a disc stack and, and a decanter. And uh, you'll see those in some, uh, some large uh, commercial breweries, uh, as well as pharmaceutical plants and things like that. They're, uh, they're great machines, but they're a little bit pricey because they have to have high G-force, so the tolerances and manufacturing uh, aspect are a little bit more precise than something like a belt press or a decanter. Um, the decanter, you can see, covers the broadest range of feed solid concentration as well as particle size. These machines are very versatile. They're the pickup truck of the um, they're a lot more tolerant to vibration and uh, temperature change and things like that. Um, they don't, they're not as finicky. They, uh, they can handle heavy feed solids. We can pump anything up into those things, uh, you know, 90% by solids volume. As long as it's pumpable, the decanter can handle the material. The feed, feed rate has to be taken into account though. I mean, obviously you can't overfeed them and plug them up, but uh, they can handle that real heavy solids load, which comes in this process, especially at, uh, the point where you get the heaviest slug of trube coming down through your whirlpool. Um, it can be unpredictable. Sometimes you'll see uh, low solids concentration coming through for a long time and all of a sudden one big slug of solids comes through. Uh, sometimes you can have more of a or more of a uniform feed as well. It depends on the whirlpool and uh, a few other factors, the pump and uh, the piping as well. The belt press is thrown in there as well because we make those also. And uh, it's a good example of um, a machine that can separate not just like a pumpable liquid, but a, a, a straight up pulp. You can grind apples, you can grind carrots, you can throw your uh, spent grains from the louder ton on top of it and it'll dewater that stuff, uh, give you a nice dry product. But then again, it, it doesn't get down to the very small particles like yeast or some of the uh, proteins and things like that. Those are going to go right through the belt, obviously. So, uh, the decanter is the preferred uh, system for this particular uh, process because of those capabilities. Now, the, there's a lot of different kinds of decanter centrifuges. One is the uh, discharge by gravity, which is what we use here. And basically that is to push the liquid out using an impeller, uh, which is basically like a centripetal pump that you would have in your disc sac centrifuge. Uh, only on the decanter, it's adjustable. So it's a variable impeller and we can adjust that impeller. Let's see the picture here. We can adjust that impeller to a smaller or larger diameter to take out more liquid or less liquid to dig deeper into the liquid low layer or shallower into it to control the uh, not only the liquid clarity but the solids dryness as well. This uh, picture here basically shows the decanter centrifuge, the interior view of it. You can see the feed inlet from the uh, right side of the screen coming in. It comes out through the uh, scroll ports into the uh, decanter body, the bowl body. And it's the solids are conveyed forwards by the scroll flights. The liquid is scooped out at the back end of the impeller, the back end of the machine by the impeller. I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but it's right here at the right side. And the pressure of the rotating machine pushes the liquid into the disc. The liquid flows back this way and is discharged under pressure and can pump up to 28 psi back to the tank or to your work cooler, or whichever direction it's going. Most of the time with this process, we go back into the whirlpool itself while it's doing the whirlpool rest and uh, enter the tank tangentially in the direction of rotation. Uh, 
this is a good display of uh, the impeller system, how it works. If you move that handle, the disc basically rotates on an eccentric like a cam lobe, and you can take a deeper or shallower cut out of liquid. And as I said, that'll give you either a, a cleaner liquid, dirtier liquid, a little more dry solids or a little wetter solid. There's a, a little bit of adjustment you can do there. And those aren't the only factors for those uh, particular characteristics of the product. There's other adjustments that can be made as well, but that's uh, what this particular adjustment will do. The one thing that's super important with this process is the hygienic aspect. Obviously, the machine has to be hygienic. It has to CIP very well. Um, the scroll and the interior of the bowl are electro-polished. Um, you can see the figures there. Kind of which micron uh, they are polished to. Um, the housing is polished as well with polished welds. It's all stainless steel. Anywhere that the product touches will be uh, will stainless will be stainless steel. There's one step higher in terms of hygienic that we can go, um, and that's usually what would be done for uh, pharmaceutical grade machines and things like that. That's um, the next step beyond this, um, but this is what would be the standard beverage grade or food grade hygienic uh, execution. In terms of keeping a machine clean, one thing that has to be done is uh, thorough CIP. Every time uh, the system shuts down or shift change, something like that, it, it set intervals to make sure that the uh, system goes through a thorough CIP cleaning. You can see here a diagram that shows the uh, liquid inlet and outlet points. One that we focus on very carefully is inlet number three, you can see, and that is basically the, uh, the interior scroll wash. So you can see the nozzle spraying inside of the scroll body. That is cleaning the inside of the scroll where the feed is first deposited in the machine. And that's an area where uh, the G-force likes to collect solids and uh, force them into little cracks and crevices. So uh, the interior scroll flush is one of the, the key points for the CIP cleaning on this. Uh, the other ones that are pretty critical are uh, point number one, that's cleaning the inside of the, the machine itself through your feed inlet, it's gonna discharge into the uh, into the bowl and go out through the liquid discharge and the solids discharge. Cleaning both of those areas. <clears throat> On a system, when we when we skid mount these things and uh, build a complete system down there around where the number five is, there would also be a spray ball and a solid chute to collect or to clean the solid chute as the solids are discharged down into the pump. So cleaning the pump area as well. And item or point six and seven are cleaning the outside of the rotating assembly. So as the bowl is rotating and the solids are coming out in that area, those nozzles are washing the uh, the bowl, and just all that water is going down the drain to the uh, solids pumping your CIP return. And this is based on a system that would process around fifty uh, between thirty five and fifty barrels an hour. So here's a good example of. What we're talking about basically you have the whirlpool you have the hot tube that collects in the bottom of it you drain your wart off uh, what comes out the bottom the tube pile typically there's a little bit of beer loss sometimes there's a lot of beer loss it really depends on the uh, the brewery system but uh, what we see coming out of the machine in uh, terms of dry solids and uh, uh, liquid you know, once you separate that or you spin it down in a laboratory set test tube, what we see coming out of the machine could be a, as much as 75% liquid um, and all of that being your hot water. The next slide here shows some samples. So this was a, a run at a, a large brewery. And as you initiate this process, as the whirlpool rest is happening and as you're uh, processing this tube, You'll, uh, you'll see the feed change. Like I said before, it's not consistent. Sometimes it'll get really thick all of a sudden. Uh, these samples were taken in about 10 minute intervals. Even the bottom ones are the feed samples. You can see at the bottom of those cups, there's a, a good bit of floating solid or fluffy solid there. Um, the third sample over, you can see it's increased a bit. And then the fourth sample is a huge difference, just tons and tons of uh, solids in that. That's a good example of how, uh, how dense, how thick this stuff can be. We've uh, we've talked with people about using a disc stack centrifuge for this process, but our opinion is that once you get to that point, it's too unpredictable and you have a very good chance of plugging the machine up. Um, if anybody's ever plugged up a disc stack centrifuge, you know it's not fun. You have to take the whole thing apart. Um, it gets to be a real chore. So if you can avoid that, it certainly makes sense. 
and by looking at the solid samples at the top that were collected, uh, the discharge solids, you can see they're quite dry and you'll never get solids like that out of a disinsect centrifuge. It'll always be uh, a wet, mushy kind of solid. So that's the other advantage of this. The, your actual liquid recovery is going to be a higher uh, quantity as well. So, But after that fourth sample, you can see that the, the solids tapered right off again. And then by the fifth sample, by, by the sixth sample there, uh, there's almost nothing left in the feed. And at that point, we know we have collected all of the tube that we're going to get out of that system. So that's basically a, it's not quite an hour. I think what we took does a little bit less than 10 minute intervals, but probably a 45 to 50 minute run um, at about, I think that was 35 barrels per hour. So, and again, you can see how dry the solids are at the top. That's what we are uh, discharging from the machine. And that's what would go to your spent grain collection or however else you decide to dispose of it. The work back to the Whirlpool, you can see is also uh, pretty clean. Typically, that would have less than a half percent of uh, suspended solids in it when it heads back to the uh, whirlpool or forward to the fermenters. Some process parameters and results. Typical feed temp is usually about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's just what's coming off of the uh, whirlpool. Feed inlet solids can be anywhere from 15 to 60 percent by volume, as you saw in those last photos. There was. Uh, quite a difference between uh, the, the first, second, third, and then fourth sample was obviously very heavy in solids. The torn wort containing less than a quarter percent by solids by volume. Um, we've seen far less than that in some, in some cases, not even a detectable amount, depending on what kind of whirlpool additions you're making. Uh, what, there's a lot of different ingredients that are added at that point. Some people are putting fruit in there, some people are putting hops in there. It just depends on what is what whirlpool additions you're making. And up to 98% recovery of hot work that would normally be lost with the tube pile. So if you have uh, any sizable losses at all, this is a process that could really uh, could really pay dividends. So with this uh, small system we've got, and this is basically just referring to one system, we can go anywhere from five to 30 barrels an hour. We do have larger systems than that uh, in some of the, the major brews, but we haven't really found a need for a higher flow rate, um, even on the uh, the large one that I said was about a thousand barrel brew house. It, uh, we were still only running about 30 barrels an hour out of that one, 35 barrels an hour. So um, it's not, it's a bit like the tank bottoms, uh, the fermenter tank bottom process. We don't need to process the entire volume and we don't need to have a high flow rate. And then the last thing, automated CIP sequence. That's obviously critical. Uh, often gets tied right in with the brewery's main control system. And when uh, in between batches or at the end of a shift, they'll uh, run through a CIP process. So that was my last slide there. And uh, anyone's got any questions, don't hesitate to ask or reach out to us. Um, Andrew, the craft beer professionals, uh, has our contact information. He's always a nice guy. He's willing to hand, hand that out. Uh, we're also on the Facebook group, pretty active on the craft beer professionals Facebook group. Always happy to answer questions on that too if you want to look me up. So thanks a lot for uh, watching. Thanks for having me on here today, Andrew, and everybody take care. Have a great week. Goodbye.